This is Tuesday, November 20th, and this is the third of the interviews with Pauline Trigere for the oral history program at the Fashion Institute of, uh, of Technology. Pauline, when we talked last, I told you that one of the things that I wanted to pursue was something that you dropped lightly in the first uh, uh, interview that we did, but uh, you made reference to the fact that you'd get back to it, I'm going to now make you get back to it. I want to know the whole story of your relationship to Adele Simpson. Oh, well, <laughs> it's very funny. My mother, I told you, had a brother here who came from Russia many, many years ago. And he was a sample tailor, I suppose. He also was one of the first workers who really was uh, involved in the creation of the union. I mean, he was one of the first guys who always, I remember the letters, I was a little girl when I heard my mother and her sister bemoaning the fact that the brother, the rich uncle of America, really was in strike. He was always striking. They were always striking because we were trying to form uh, the nuclear, nucleus? Nucleus. Nucleus of what the union is today. And this is the ILGWU? That's right, but that was way before that. And my uncle was <coughs> always on strike. Anyway, one day, I guess he got, he was living in Philadelphia, but then he couldn't find work there. He came to New York and became a sample tailor for a firm named Ben Gershaw, which comes back in my life a little later on. And then one day, I forgot what year it was, I was a small little girl, but I remember the great agitation. We got a letter from America that everybody read around the table that my uncle's designer was coming to Paris to buy God knows what or to see. But anyway, it, was, it wasn't even buying couture because they were making coats, I suppose. These people. The man's name was Goldstein. And my mother and her sister got all money together to give, to give a great big gala dinner for this apparition from America, who would bring the two sisters a friendly regard from their brother, you know, the little brother from America. And my brother was delegated to go to the Gare Saint-Lazare to pick up this man. Those days you took the boat to Cherbourg or Le Havre, and then the boat and the train took you to Paris. And my brother was, I don't know, age 15, 16, he was very young, maybe not even that, went to the Gare Saint-Lazare. And what does he discover? That the Mr. Goldstein is accompanied by two ladies, two women. He's charged to ask in his broken English to come for dinner at night, and he had to bring three people. And he brought to our Smithline and her sister, Anna Smithline, and that's how I met Adele, and it's going way back. Then she came to New York, my brother, at that time, Adele, she was just assisting her sister, who was a designer. She married Cyril Mack. She's dead many years now. Anna Smithline married Cyril Magnin of the Magnin branch, but you know, Joseph Magnin, not the big Magnin, the other Magnin. And Adele and her sister used to come to Paris to buy things and see couture by then for the film of Ben Gershaw. And Robert Trigère was the delegate to show them Paris. I mean, the Louvre, Tour Eiffel, and so on, we became very good friends. And one day we lost track of her, I mean, you know, we didn't know when she was coming, and one day on Rue Saint-Honoré, in April 29, my brother bumped into Adele, who was there for two, three days, she was not yet married, and he says, you must come to my sister's wedding on Sunday, and she came to my wedding, it's a funny story. Oh, so when we came here, the first person we went to see was Adele, her sister was then living in San Francisco. So we've been good friends ever since, always. She was helpful to you when you arrived here? She was helpful in the fact that, first of all, she's a no-nonsense person. She didn't understand why we came here. I mean, we were on the way to Chile, and you know, we didn't speak any language. We had no knowledge of what America was at all. We didn't know the requirement. I was going to be, I told you, a housefrau and a mother. And I guess she probably found it very strange. She had a very successful business by the name of Mary Lee then. And honestly, at first she thought we were nuts. But then when we had this first little collection of coats, she was right. I mean, you just admit this, this is what it was. 
And so she told us, you know, that we should really do dresses and suits and ensembles and coordinate. And she was right, and that was that. I love these threads that make the total tapestry of one's personal as well as professional life, particularly when names of uh, uh, people like Dell Smithline mm -hmm. becomes the Dell Simpson in the minds of everybody in this mm -hmm. country. Another area that I wanted to pursue with you is that uh, throughout the interviews you've made light references to Lucy Porges, is it? Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S. As your assistant, but I sense in when you talk about her that it's larger than the usual association oh, well, we have. As it is assistant. indeed, because Lucy is with me 28 years now, and so it seems absolutely improbable and stupid or crazy to say that somebody has been with you 28 years, would you believe it? Yet, um, when she became pregnant, for the first time 20, 22 years, 23 years ago, my desire was to have her have the baby on the cutting table. I thought it would have been <laughs> terribly nice. Lucy has been a part of my life. I'm sure I'm part of her life. And she came as a sketcher, you know, in those days. She came from Paris. Uh, she's born in Vienna. She was born in Vienna and came here. Well, she was educated in France, so everybody thinks she's, for a while, they all thought she was my sister because we have the same kind of French accent. And we work together now, and I, can I say the word training? At first she watched, you see, doing uh, sketching, and now she's part of the Trigère organization as, uh, how would I say that, a boss. We don't have very many titles in Trigère. We don't have vice president. The, the place is too, too small for that. But I guess uh, that's what she would be. But outline for me how you conceive of the role of the assistant, because for most people, the only way they're ever going to get started is to assist Oh, well, that's somebody. a different kind. Now, you see, you talk about assistant. I don't know. Sorry. 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 The word, of a, the word assistant, to me, when uh, I think of the word in the French way, it means someone who really assists you in the designing room. Most of the time, women or men are given a sketch and they make a toile, a muslin, and when that's verified and done, it all depends in what direction and what uh, uh, are you, are you um, divide your work. But most of the time, you give a sketch to those so-called assistants who are supposed to be technician. They're supposed to be technician in making the garment. But then, uh, when you go to school and teach, as I've done and as you do, Robert, you find that the word assistant would probably um, get twisted around and have someone who can make sketches for the designer. It's never been my case. I don't need them. I don't want them. I don't need anybody who sketch for me anything because we have many more clothes in my head and in Lucy's head that will ever be produced. So we don't need that. But it can be both ways. An assistant is someone who produces the first sample. After a while, we're supposed to cut it, to fit it, to put it together. In my case, my assistants, who are rather capable, unfortunately for me, don't fit to my uh, satisfaction even today after 25 or 60. I do practically 90% of the fittings today, most of them. Maybe I go faster, I have no patience to watch, you see. You see, I remember pictures of Mr. Christian Dior with his white shirt or white blouse, you know, what, uh, what do you call it, smock, with a big stick, like at school, uh, pointing to his assistant, uh, the lapel a little higher, or the waistline. I don't do that because I go faster in doing it myself. But at Trigère, we have an assistant who does the soft clothes, who is more specialized in the chiffons and crepe de chine. And we have one who would do a better 
buyers dress in wool, and then certainly a tailor. Now, so are they working from a sketch? They're working from a sketch. Yeah. Who does the sketch? Well, I do baby sketches. Lucy makes them better. But what I do frequently is to take a piece of fabric and cut one half, then I give it to them. And then they put the other thing, they put that on paper. Uh, but the sketches, my baby sketches are understood by Benny, who is with me 20... You see, I've got a very bad reputation, Robert. I'm terribly, so they say, I'm terribly difficult to work with, to work for, and so on. But um, if they pass the six months period, they usually stay well. Benny is with me over 24, five years. Lucy, 28. Benny is another assistant? Benny is a man assistant, the tailor. And uh, he's with me many, many years. He's a pattern maker also. And uh, I have a marvelous Japanese girl that I really trained. She came to us as a, as a finisher, so, uh, you know. And we felt that she had an ability. So we gave her something to cut and something to do. That one, I not only like to work with her, but she works my way. It's the first time that I was able to really train someone in the technical part of the business to work the way I want, to trace the way I want, because the whole system, Robert, is very antiquated, very antiquated. Uh, the assistants that we have usually come from Italy, and they were all tailors or finishers or sewers. They never learned like we teach them at school today. Those assistants, the, the boys and girls that we teach at school, they all want to be designers, as you know, but some of them will be pattern makers, maybe. But it's two different trainings. What from is the difference? Well, from Europe, they come from the ranks of sewers. Mama was a sewer, Papa was a tailor. The kids naturally went to sew. And they do the technique of sewing. They know how to do the feather stitch. But that doesn't mean that you're going to be a good cutter because you do a very beautiful sewing. It is two different things. You have to have something in your finger. Some have it and some don't. I think that working well with an assistant is an extraordinary rapport. It's when you watch on television the doctor who does an operation uh, without talking, the nurse gives him the scalpel or whatever the name of those instruments. They, quickly, she knows or he knows what the doctor wants. This kind of training doesn't exist in the tailoring business, in the dress. It doesn't. We don't train people to do that, especially in America, because everybody wants to be on top before they begin to, to have a foundation. All right, let's pick that up for a moment. If you had your uh, position of power that would allow you to direct the educational process, say at the Fashion Institute of Technology, what would you change in the training of those people? Well, I thought about it a long time. In three years, I don't know what the courses are, three years or four. I think that I would, if the, those so-called kids, young people harder, want to be designer, I think that I would stress the technical part I think that I would let them work much more on a dummy to really, with fabrics, to really have the feel of what the fabric wants to do. It's very strange what I'm going to tell you. I cut with scissors made for me with my hands. I'm sure that you write with a pen that you like better than another, except it's a pencil to make a note. Each one of us has its own idiosyncrasies. I think that everybody should learn to have this kind of rapport with the fabric, with a certain pair of scissors. That's the first thing I would throw out, is the baby scissors. It's stupid what I'm going to tell you. You can't cut straight with a tiny pair of, she of shears. You have to have something bigger. That's a stupid thing, but I think it helps. You see in another, I would let them work of course, it's difficult at school because they don't have too much fabric to work with. It's expensive, I suppose. But I think the schools have made a bed. They don't know how to ask. Everybody on 7th Avenue will be very delighted to give the school lots of fabrics for free. They just don't ask. Or maybe the students have uh, in their mind some extraordinary piece of velvet or something which costs a lot of money, but if you could train them to work with what they have, it will be also very good. It's like cooking. 
If you don't have a turkey, you can do something with a, a sausage and you can have a good dinner too. Um, the process of designing, really designing, is a marvelous one because you can do things with all kinds of stuff, you know, if you really are. Now, the training of assistant and a future designer should have more technical base than they have. They do too much of sketching, choosing the fabric, cutting the garment, pressing the garment. It's a lot of thing for two years. It's too much and nothing is in depth. The person who sketches, the student who sketches well, probably has it easier than the other if he sketches well because it gives you immunity and aura of having a great uh, talent as possible. A sketch is beautiful unless it's executed in a dress, forget it, you know. But I mean, at least you have that to show the teacher. To do the garment, to have something that have uh, a feeling either on a girl, it's very tough, um, really, Robert, to tell you that because I would prefer the student to really do the thing on the dummy, or do it well. I have a theory that if it fits a dummy well, it'll fit somebody. It's very difficult for those kids, I call them kids because they are young and willing, I suppose. I find it very difficult to try to fit a garment on a live person. It's, this comes later. You have to have, it's like Picasso we talked about. First he knew how to draw, then he can make his eccentricity. But before he knew how to draw, we have that great difficulty at school. There is not enough basic training to, to have in their heads. It's, it's strange. I don't know, I think it should be all re-evaluated. I think that the school wants to have that beautiful fashion show at the end of the trimester or the semester or the whatever, and to have something to show. <coughs> I, think, <coughs> I, I don't think it's necessary, you see. I think it would be much more valid to have two years of perfect training without having any garment and not having anybody telling you after six months, I've designed that dress. There is a difference between designing it and making it. Making is one thing, designing is another. It's all very involved. And I think uh, that the first price at a school is sometimes very dangerous. You know, to have your sketches put on the board and you won the first prize. Where do you go from there? It can be deceptive in terms of it, uh, allowing a person to believe that they have nothing more to learn. Like what they have now is to just contribute their creative talent. On the other hand, I suppose the reason that that sort of thing is done is that we live in a society which is based upon rewards. You know, as we, as we grow up in our families, we are given rewards. If you're good, you get dessert. If you're bad, you, go, you don't, don't watch television. It's true. And uh, because of that, part of the educational process has also been directed to the reward system. But uh, let me pursue something else with you, Paulie. When you talk to people about Trigere, and uh, oh, I think almost to a person, they will tell you that they're fascinated with the fact that you can take a pair of scissors and take some fabric, and you start to cut, and voila, you have created a dress. And most people, of course, do not understand how this magic occurs. It, to a lot of people, it's a vaudeville act, you know, it becomes... It some, is. Uh, I've done it many times. It, it becomes, it's really funny to do, because I enjoy doing it. It's the hem in me, <laughs> and the theatrical uh, career that I never pursued that just comes out. It's fun to do. I realize that I did the first time that I did it in public, of course, I did it at many schools, but the first time I did it at pub, paying public was in Chicago at the, the, the museum, and I had an audience that they had to repeat the act twice. It's very funny. I think that comes with an enormous experience, but the process of draping, taking a piece of fabric and draping it, like I suppose Madame Grace does, like I'm sure Madame Lanvin used to do, and possibly Balenciaga. I know Norel did it too, though. He sketched beautifully, but when he wanted a special effect, because there is something that happens when you put the material, somehow 
uh, some way, somehow, it dictates something to you. It doesn't happen often, but... Yeah, then let, let's, let's concentrate on that word. What, see, the essence of this is what is dictated to you when the you fabric. feel the fabric and you have the scissors? The fabric. Is, do you have a previous idea of something, a direction that you want to take? In Sometimes. Terms of, uh -huh. Sometimes I do if it's a plain fabric and I said, well, I like to make a very full coat. My sketch will never give the effect of the fullness I want. I'll take it, I'll drape it, all right. If it is a panel print, you know what a panel print is, yes. you know, something that's uh, 60 inches wide and it's got a border at the bottom. Or is it, that, I have to put it on the, on the model, on the dummy, and start playing with it, that's the word. And I put it on the right side and the wrong side, you know, the right side, of course, on the cross, on the bias, until all of a sudden, in the mirror, I always work in the mirror, in the front of a mirror. I never look at the model. I always look at the model at about two yards. You work the reflection of the mirror. Always. And you see, this is even is that a straight see, mirror or a three-way mirror? No, no, a straight mirror. Straight. I couldn't wear in a three-way because then I would get yes. myself in the right. way. I always work in a mirror if I see a length, if I see... We always look at the mirror to see if something is right. And there is something that happened. I drape in my poor model sometimes, uh, her back aches. Well, you know, I work them. In terms of, of collection, we really are on our legs quite a bit. More, more so in France than here, because in Paris, I understand that the models stay up until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning forget here. They would call that slavery here. Anyway, at 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock, <coughs> I take a piece of fabric, and I, sometimes I can see my model's face having some reaction, a sweet reaction. And I know I'm on the right track because I can feel that she likes what's happening. Sometimes she will make a funny grimace or something and I don't pursue it. It goes fast. I can do a very beautiful, very superb clothes. Sometimes in 10 minutes. I mean, just one half, you know. Yes. Sometimes you sleeve. What I do... When you do a half, which side do you do? The right side. I always work on the right side. Always on the right side. I'm, a, you know, we always work on the... My assistant, uh, Benny, who is a left-handed man, it's very funny because he uses left-handed scissors, which I made specially for his left hand. My scissors I made for my hand, too. Nobody touches them. I have a long pair of shears. When you to, say made for you, what they I made the hand, it's like the people with their guns or the golf or the thing. The, hand, the, the, the loop of the scissors, it's a big one, was made for me in Paris. 20 years ago. Did it do your hand? Yes, so that the balance of the shear, which is heavy and big, doesn't weigh. It's a strange thing, but it doesn't happen often. It's a very special pair of scissors. It's like everything else. I don't think I could get one made like this ever. Uh, when I start working, I can go on with no stop for hours. But sometimes the creative process is not Sometimes you feel not so well, sometimes you're tired. Sometimes I would say to one of the models, say, stay with me for an hour tonight. And I would have, within 10 minutes, 10 pieces of different fabrics making a big mountains of mess on the stage where I work. I touch them and I feel them and I drape them. And then at night, I think about what I've done. And it comes back to me. I leave the fabric completely untouched, unrolled, on just before the man comes to sweep, so we put them away, because actually they are very fragile. But I wouldn't cut anything. It's something that somehow there is a, a, per, a period of digestion, can I say that? Or ingestion, call it what you may. And then I come back to it, and the picture is extremely clear in my mind of what I'm going to do with that. I can, for well, I don't sketch, but I could make you a décolleté of a dress, good or bad, that doesn't mean that you have to like it. But with a very sure hand, I would cut on a dummy a décolleté which, which is going to be exactly right in five minutes, where if I made a sketch and gave it to an assistant, it may take hours, days, and when it comes back to me, I said, when did we ask for that? Because I don't recognize it. You mentioned in an early interview that you are stimulated by many things that happen to you during any day or any evening, and you make notes on envelopes, on uh, 
maximum limitations, whatever it may be. Now, after you've played with the fabrics with your model who has remained, and after you come home and you think about those individual things, and they begin to, I think... Gel. Uh, yeah, I think uh, gel is a very good term, because uh, one edits in one's own mind. You eliminate this, or you, you uh, uh, add this, or subtract that, and suddenly you have something that visually you can see in your head, the image. Do you ever look over your other notes and then find yourself thinking, ah, I could make that this direction? Or? Yes, I also find that in my little sketches that I keep sometimes on the programs, those clothes get never made because I'm so sure of them. I know so vividly and so perfectly what I want to do that I'm trying to get other things done and the dress that I should have made in the first place doesn't get uh, made. You see, it's a very peculiar thing, the process of really uh, create design. Because in my case, let's say, at Trigère, I am responsible to a firm who sells certain things. First, we have to have enough, we hope to have enough work for the contractors. For that, you need the basic things. So in the fall collection, we know what we're going to do approximately. Before I look at a new chalet or at a new print or at a new velvet or whatever, I know that my jersey dresses in the new colors, six or eight of them should be made. These are really made mostly on, on paper, little sketches. And we know we have to get rid of that. Then we have to have a certain amount of coats or suits. This is the backbone of the collection. Yeah. Things that we feel, I feel, that our customer will want to find in a Trigère collection. Then after that, we'll put the little embroidery. It's like maybe the little pastry trimming. The cake may be very good, and then you begin to trim it up with uh, funny things. So then we start by adding uh, evening dresses, fancy fabrics, and all of that. It's different on, I, for me, it's a great responsibility to do the thing that I hope will sell for Trigia because we need that to live, to the fabric that I buy. Let's say we are now in November. November and December, I'm going to buy fabrics which will come to us January, February. Then we'll make it, we're going to show the collection March or April or May. Then we'll ship them, God knows, in August. The family that we buy now to make and show in April, I can't afford to have them on the shelves. If I made a mistake in buying something, I've got to find a, a way to get rid of it somehow. That's very difficult. Now, when you are a designer for a, a firm incorporated XYZ, you may have that in your mind, but I don't think so. I have this responsibility en plus, you know, on top of all that, because it's uh, my money, it's the money of the firm, and I can't afford to just let the fabric on the shelves, you know, that's awfully costly. So that's another responsibility. One of the areas that, of course, everyone is, I think everyone who knows the fashion industry is aware of, is that you may be one of the, you know, the last of a dying breed. Uh, Why? Meaning, well, meaning that your interest in quality and your interest in in uh, the hidden quality in garments is uh, almost extreme in the sense that you, you yes, fight for it's that. it's nutty. I'm telling you. Because it becomes prohibitive price-wise since everything is so expensive. So we try to, I wouldn't call the word well, to compromise a little bit. We have to. We used to finish every dress by hand. We can't. And Sincerely, and uh, I don't think the customers really appreciate. Well, they don't know. They used to know. They don't anymore. I think that's an important thing to understand for designers, that the world of people who bought couture clothes back 50, 75, 100 years ago was a world of women who had a career in relationship to their wardrobes. Their, their role was to understand their clothes, to enjoy their fittings, to compete with their, the world around them. Uh, they were educated to the world of clothes. They knew 
You see, the world of fittings, the way I understood it when I was uh, listening to the people co talking about couture in Paris, and when I met Balenciaga who came here to talk with me one evening, right in this apartment, and we talked, he told me, his first fittings were in white thread or something like this. The second fitting was blue thread, and the third fitting was pink. And uh, each fittings and the changes on the woman, you haven't got, there is no money in the world, you, can aff you can't anymore. But the tailor at Balenciaga, who was under his direction fitting Mrs. What Have You, knew what he was doing, I hope. But she knew that she had to stay she had to stay for an hour or so to be fitted for a dress. That, those women, they don't know anymore. They don't exist. The woman has no time. That's Take the lane, get finished. Nobody has the time. It's a double education rapport between the tailor, the, 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 the designer, and the woman who stood in the front of a mirror to be fitted and enjoying it. It's not only the fact that the reality that that woman's role has changed so that many women who can afford uh, couture clothes, know very little about clothes other than the, their satisfaction of looking in the mirror and saying, I like it, I'll take it, uh, that's a big difference. But also I think the, the, the designer, for instance, you said something the other day that uh, Mrs. Kissinger, Nancy Kissinger, was in your place and was there for three hours and you said it like maybe she has nothing to do but I have much work to do because three hours for you to spend with one customer. I didn't really spend with actually what she was doing was playing on. She was really waiting for her mother to disappear. I don't know. So she stayed a long time, and she watched me buying fabric. She was very amused, and she, you know, she said, "Gee, you're lucky that you're working." I said, "Yes, I am. I guess, you know." Uh, but just to tell you about Mrs. Kissinger, for instance, I don't know what you're going to do with those tapes. But I remember Nancy when she came to us the very first time. She's tall, and. Uh, it's very small on top, a little bigger in the hips. I learned, you know, I know her body by heart. I can fit Mrs. Kissinger on the dummy, and it'll fit because I prepared the thing before if I want to do that. That's another thing. Maybe that's one of my capacity, ability, is to, somebody in the fitting rooms would say, but you didn't take my measurement. I said, no, I don't have to because I know what your body looks in comparison to my model and I can have it cut on the table. That I know. Well, with Nancy, who started to fit, me fitting, I could do anything I wanted with her. And then she, after two years, she says, Pauline, don't you think it should be released? In the past three years, this lady has learned so much about her own self. She knows what a dress does for her at night. In the beginning, she, she still buys an awful lot of clothes everywhere. But she knows, she sees herself in the, in the papers, and she knows the reaction she has. This is a process of, uh, but she would tell me before, if I fit the top, she says, what about it? I said, just a minute, Nancy, I'm not there yet, you know. I start with the top and I go down like this. It's funny because she learned a lot. I personally, I put on a dress, you know, all my clothes are fitted for me. I very seldom, except a sample, which has been fitted buy me on a girl a coat I can go by, I, co I can get by by wearing a coat, but otherwise I wear bigger clothes and I like them loose and I like to feel comfortable. And when I have something to do for me, I do my own fittings on a size 12 dummy and I know exactly that I need a bigger back because I've got a big back and I, you know, I know all my little funny little things, I know that I want my, whatever it is, I fit on the dummy and I put the dress and it goes. But I know my body by heart, too. Lucy, for instance, who is tiny, she's an eight, sometimes a six. She gets, of course, her clothes at Trigère, and somebody fits them and fiddle with them. And she always tells me, Pauline, can I have your fitting? Once every season, I have to fit her dress personally. She feels, I hope rightly, that it has another feeling, because I know her. What can I tell you? Yes. That's a very special skill. Now, can it be taught? Yes, I think it can. It can be taught if the person has eyes. Do you know what I mean by eyes? Come. Some people, well, some people don't see. They look, but they don't see. And it happens, it's very strange what I'm telling you. Some people, if you have this ability, my little 
Japanese girl. I try, I said, I don't understand why you did this like that. You're right. I said, why did you do it like this? Don't you? Yes. She grasped. Some people, you talk and talk. Does she have a name? Does she have a name? Yes. Her name is Yoshimi. You know, she's petite and nice and... Mm. Interesting that uh, Lucy, Yoshimi, do you think these are people? Obviously, Lucy has no ambitions to go out on her own. Well, I don't know if she does an ambition to have on her own. I think she's doing very well at Trigère, and uh, she's my partner in design more and more. I go much faster than anybody, so naturally I would have, you know, I can do. I'm a fast worker when I work. But I don't work, I'm fast anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Lucy, her ambition is to design and to do extraordinary things. And my little, uh, how do I say, it? it's not uh, discussion with her right now, is to not to go in those extravagance that we can't do any longer. I mean, you know, the, well, she says, you taught me all that. And now I say, well, I taught you things that I knew I would, you know, you have to compromise a little bit in the cut of things. It's so expensive, everything. So we have to try to stylize, maybe, that's not the word, to simplify. See, what we lack today in workers and in technicians, we're trying to put on paper in better made patterns. That's another one of my beats. I would like to have lots of people going into patterns. But for that, again, they have to have more technique than what they have. Perhaps the reason that they don't like to go into patterns is that the fantasy of being a designer, or being a name, being a star, of course, is not applied to the pattern maker. That's right. Their names is not in the paper. That's right. But it's a very rewarding, it's a very clean work. It pays very, very well. I don't know, it's tough, you know, it's like everything else. When you get your car overhauled, when you get your car, you used to go to a garage and 25 years ago. I used to go around the corner from me in the country and there was a young boy there who could take the car apart and put it back together. Today they send you back to where the car comes from. Yes. They don't know how to change. They rather forget a boat instead of putting it, you know. Everywhere else, I mean, everything is quick, fast, change. I don't know. It's the world of... Uh, well, this is, uh, yes, and uh, we live in an instant world, you see. Absolutely. We have instant foods, instant beverages, instant love affairs, instant marriages, instant divorces. Yeah, uh, all of these things are important to understand because it's, it makes it increasingly difficult for to find well, people who are willing to take uh, a program that will really allow them to grow over a long period time, of time. It's very, very rewarding to see people who really want learn anything in any kind of profession, everywhere. But I think the world of traveling, everything goes fast. You go fast with your car, you take a plane, you are in Paris in three hours, or in Frankfurt or wherever. It's a world of rapidity and mechanism, I Do think. Do you think um, a designer is influenced by that reality that, for instance, people don't want to take a lot of luggage when they oh, travel yes, anymore? absolutely. Though, uh, years ago, when you used to pay for every pound of luggage, you were, I was never careful because I always travel with 15 pairs of shoes. <coughs> it's, it's heavy, but today they don't weigh you. But I think that this is what's interesting in my work today. When you go into a fitting room, a woman said, I'm going to wherever they go, and I have to get. So we form a wardrobe. I like that. I like a woman who is intelligent about a wardrobe, not buying everything in sight and then uh, nothing matches. Uh, yet I have a friend of mine who told me last night she's going for three months on a boat. I don't know, she gave me the name of the boat. It's a fabulous trip around the world. I couldn't, I couldn't, I said, three months? I mean, what do you have to pack? It's three months to be with the same people on a boat? I couldn't do it, but uh, I guess some people, that also takes time, it's an organization. Do you have an attitude towards uh, planning a wardrobe? I mean, what, if, what would you advise, say, a, a person? Um, oh, yes, I have an attitude. Sometimes I always say that I have nothing to wear, but when I go on a trip, now I'm going to Chicago, and I, I, I know that my morning work would be a pair of pants and a sweater. It's Chicago, so it's cold. Then I have my so-called dress for the evening, naturally, for the, for the presentation of the thing. I do my wardrobe in one color. 
always. Now this time it's going to be black because it's only two days and it's going to be, if I go to Palm Beach, it's going to be white, pale, blue, red, I don't know. And it's going to be that, it's going to be red. From the day of the morning to the week I'll spend in Palm Beach. I so simplify the relationship to accessories. To my bags, and my shoes, the thing that go with it, you know, the scarf that will go with two or three outfits. I think women have learned to do this a lot uh, these days, some of them anyway, do. We well. are at this moment, in 1979, the end of 79, facing uh, an obvious series of crises in the world, including an economic crisis. Um, there is, whether one wants to believe it or not, there is a recession. As a designer, dealing with rather expensive clothes, do you find that you think about that in terms of how extravagant the dress might be? Yes. So the, yes. The, the, the expand on I that. do, but it's very strange, Robert, that a dress, as expensive it may be, if it's pretty, you'll sell it. It's not always true of a coat, of a jersey dress, because the people are going to be, we attack, uh, or attract rather, many more women, and so some will graduate themselves to a three-year jersey dresses because they know they'll wear it for many, many seasons. But you have an extravagant in evening clothes. Uh, it's a different thing altogether, uh, because if you go over $2,000, which is a tremendous amount of money, you have to have the woman who can afford it, who know that she's going to wear it in New York two, three times, then she'll go somewhere else and wear it again. You have to have a, a woman who travels to be able to get the, uh, the run of that dress. You know. I was thinking of another direction, though, dear. I was oh. thinking of the, of the fact that, as a designer, you look at the society and say this is not a period of... Uh, ostentation. People are going to be very nervous about showing that they have a great deal of money when other people are really in great financial difficulty. You don't want to, you know, it uh, doesn't want to be let them eat cake time. Do you design with that in mind? Do you yes. Uh, yes. keep things simpler and more? Yes, but this, the clothes at Trigger are always simpler, but we also try to make them work both ways for a cocktail and dinner. I try to have a dress that will really be interesting to a woman to buy, then she can really have a long run out of it. Uh, we used to make fabulous embroidery. We cut that out because the price is ridiculous. You know, very ridiculous. But it's very bad, really, when you try to be too practical, because then you get the enchantment of the thing. Is lost. Out is lost. Yeah. So you cannot. Sometimes I feel that uh, dress that I in, in the process of being made, I'm going to have to watch the pattern making of that, and I know it's going to be. Maybe it influences me badly. I suppose uh, I stop making something that has too many little pleats or thing because it, the, the the labor is going to be so prohibitive that we won't be able to sell it yet. It doesn't make any difference. We made this year a very, very pretty dress in a fabulous fabric that cost $80 a yard. It was with gold thread, very fine. And I found out, the supplier came to see me last week, and he said, from France, he says, thank you very much, we did so well. And I said, gee, I'm curious. How many times did we, did, did we do that dress? We called it the Dynasty. It was a marvelous uh, lady from China, I don't know, I can't, in, in the finesse of that chiffon. And we did the dress 104 times. The dress sold for $1,800, I think. Well, it's a lot of dresses at that price. Yes. And the woman who buys that certainly doesn't want to see herself coming and going. But if a dress is pretty, and if it has femininity, you sell it. Extravagance in America is something marvelous. And then there is also uh, the fact that a woman wants to show off. She knows that her friends will know that the dress cost more than a thousand dollars and she would be maybe more respected. There is that kind of snobbism, I suppose, attached to it. Thank God for that. Yes, there's a certain amount of status symbol involved with uh, being able to wear something which is so beautifully cut and so beautifully made or so luxurious in fabric, or so fragile in fabric, that one is saying, I don't have to worry about whether I get a great deal of wear out of this or not. Yeah, but uh, 
I, in my work, I'm trying to be very sensible in the thing that I do. Because at the end, I think that the customer who would have bought and worn a dress, no matter what price she pays, with pleasure, is going to come back to us saying, I loved it, it served me well. And I try to continue to do that in the workmanship, in the lining inside. I try to make it attractive to her so that she really feels that she's got something. I tell you, because I was involved with doing this tape with you, um, I began to talk at dinner parties, just dropping the name Trigier to get a reaction, to see what would happen. Turning to my dinner partner at the right and saying... You say it's uh, too expensive. Uh, no, no. <laughs> no. Matter of fact, what I got was one of the most fascinating uh, responses was from a lady from uh, Houston, Texas, who said to me, um, I have a Trigier dress that I wear and I wear and I wear. And I said, tell me about it. Well, really what she was describing was a black wool dress. And I said, why do you wear it so much? She said, it is exactly the same as going to my jeweler. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, when I go to is my jeweler, nice? he puts out the black velvet and he shows me the jewelry on the black velvet. When I realized that, I thought, ah, I will buy my Trigier dress and it will always serve as my black velvet for my jewelry. It's true, well, I'm pleased with that remark. I thought it was very intelligent, as a matter of fact. What, what I get at cocktail parties is the woman who comes to me, I've got a quote from you. I said, don't tell me it's 10 years old. Yes, it is 10 years old. <laughs> and I very facetiously answer. I say, how do you want me to retire if you buy a coat every 10 years, you know? But it's satisfactory. It's me. interesting because some of the museum people around the, around the country say that they, they find it difficult to collect Trigere clothes because the women don't want to give them up. No, that's right. Well, we, we, we have a few. I mean, we have a few. Something happened to me yesterday. I went to a huge black tie party and a woman came in with the jacket I wore at the pension fund last week. I didn't have the dress to go with it, so I wore the jacket, long gold and black brocade. Very simple, but it's gold and black and sensational in the fabric. I wore the jacket and yesterday at this party, this woman comes with this jacket, but without my dress and she has some kind of a skirt underneath long. I don't know the lady, she's very pretty in a size 12 or 14, and I said, oh, what a pretty jacket. And she says to me, thank you, it's a big blast. And I said, I beg your pardon? Yesterday it was. She says, I said, where did you get it? She says, at Nandesk in Philadelphia. I said, it's not a big blast, it's a trigère. She said, this is my husband. And I said, I'm Pauline Trigère, and I know the jacket, I made it in his mind. She says, are you sure? I said. Could I? So I picked up the back, and of course she has the Pauline Trigger label. I mean, it was no mistake, and it's a thing we shipped two weeks ago. And she bought it, she thinks she's wearing a Bill Blast. I have to tell Bill that story, because I think it's very funny. She was a little embarrassed after that, but, you know, it didn't bother me. I think it was very funny. Now, of course, her assigning the jacket to Bill Blast uh, is something that she did in her own head. But it is true that lots of people, I don't mean Bill, but other people, have knocked you off. I mean, one sees copies of Trigier dresses. Yes. How do you feel about that? Well, at first, years ago, I felt incensed and furious. Today, I go with, who said that, Robert, that uh, copy is the best form of flattery, so yes. what the hell? Imitation is the best form of flattery. Ima right. If I am not dry and I can make another dress and another coat, I got resigned to it. I have a very funny incident. Uh, I'm doing coats for Rape Schraders, and it's been a very first season and very good. And we made a coat with special buttons that I had made by my button maker, and then he bought it, I don't know, 10,000 buttons, maybe more. I don't know how many buttons he used. And he said, you know, the coat has been copied, but they can't get the buttons. I said, Ape, when they want to get the button, they'll get me. In the meantime, the coat has been copied down to whatever it is, watered down, not the same fabric, they can get the buttons. If they get, what can I tell you? I hope that the people who buy the copy recognize the difference in the making or the... I, I, it's, but in America you get that it's copied, but immediately. Yes, I think it's a logical process. I mean, after all, in the nature of people going to Paris and buying couture and making uh, copies of couture. It's a different thing because yes. they, buy the, they buy the dress to be copied. To copy it, 
Maybe they water it down, they take out a tuck or two. Here, they don't pay me anything. They no, go no, to Melton Taylor, they go to Saks, they go to wherever, they buy the garment, and sometimes they have the audacity to return it, which is really not very nice. So they do that. Uh, it's annoying. It is. But, but there is no defense. No, there is none. And I think it's the nature of the American system. You know, it is, the, it is its own kind of uh, all's fair in love and war and uh, competition, you know, in that sense. This is not even competition, but, that's what it, but it happens in almost everything. Yes. You get it in the cooking equipments, you get a cuisinard for $200, and you get something that costs uh, uh, much less, who can probably do almost the same thing. And the fascinating thing is the, the design remains almost the same. I mean, yeah. uh, your use of the cuisinart is interesting because Sunbeam, uh, a mass manufacturer, has brought out a new one as well. And at first glance, you think you're looking at a cuisinart, you know. Well, I don't know in the end if the cuisinart is going to give uh, the, the owner a longer, I hope, that my cuisiner will serve me longer than the copy. I don't know. I may not be here to, to, uh, to feel. I am, by nature, a lover of quality. I love quality. If I buy something, I'll try to buy the best. Let it be shoes or whatever I buy in the house. Certainly in my kitchen, the pots and pans that I've used. We talk cooking because you are such a great chef. My frying pans are from France. I've got them, I cannot tell you, 30 years, but they serve me well. I don't go and buy a frying pan every six. I have taught to people, I've got to go and buy a new frying I said, new, what for? I've got mine forever. And they are still perfect. We take care of them. Yes. Part of the thing is that you do take care of them. Uh, yes. One of the interesting things to realize is that um, I find with students, for instance, that they, because their own backgrounds have not brought them up to appreciate, respect the quality of something. Oh, that's, you've said it. It's just, this is something that I like to inject into people. You asked me before what would be my advice to someone. Suppose someone doesn't have too much money. I would say try to get the best you can for the money that you have. Try to get a little more, try to pay a little more for a better quality so that you have something that you can keep much longer. You buy something cheap, you got something cheap, no matter what it is. That's Except maybe in jeans. I don't know, the jeans are all made out of the same denim, so I guess that will last the same way. Well, that interesting quality is a fairly rare thing today, Pauline. Why do you think it's rare? I think, again, it's a process. Everybody wants to look like somebody else. They buy quickly something. I don't know. It's very, I don't know. I've seen people who buy silverware twice in their lifetime. Well, I have my silverware, I cannot tell you for so long, it still serves me very well. I mean, I may want to change my mood, I may not want a weekend, so I'll get something from uh, somebody else. But it's, uh, I don't know. When I wanted a table, and I went to the best maker and I got a table 25 years ago. I had Fred Victoria made that table here for dinner last week, he says, my God, I never realized that you could keep a thing like this. What do you do to it? I said, it needs refinishing. He said, no. I don't know. We try to keep it. Because I respect things. Yes. I think the operative word is respect and taking care of, you said. Uh, it's just the simple business of people who hang up their clothes properly. I would always. Away properly, you know? My clothes are hung immediately. That's one thing I do. I may drop it when I come on the floor and, you know, until, but I hang up my clothes. I don't leave. I respect them. And the clothes are pressed before they are put in the closet. Maybe I'm lucky, I take them back to the office, but even here, my girl will press something for me. And I don't send the clothes to cleaners as, oh, I remember, that was my first beef. Woman wears a dress once, psh, out it goes to the cleaner. You know, that's bad. Uh, the whole thing is a process of education, I think. I don't know if today the young people, because they want to change clothes so much and they want to be a la mode or of today's fashion, they change a lot and they buy funny little things. I'm not used to that. I can't... Yeah, I it's, a different, it's, it's another world and I think one of the reasons 
that it does exist is the instant quality of our life patterns. We move very rapidly. We talk about uh, this being a decade um, society. Things last for a decade. Now, Trujillo has lasted for many de decades mm -hmm. based upon the quality. And people uh, who come to you to buy clothes, because they range in age from uh, 20 to uh, 80, and uh, somewhere along the line, there's always that person who fills in with a, a, a identification with quality and wants it and finds where it is. But the mass of people in our society don't really believe that anything will last, including their lives. Well, it has something to do with uh, what, you know, it's been a dangerous yeah. 30, 40 years. Young, girl, young boys go to, the, to war, go and get killed. When you get this surrounding you, you feel, ah, what the hell, what do I care? I mean, you know, if you can lose a life, it doesn't matter if my coat doesn't last. It's true. And there is this lack of, uh, of wanting to, uh, to, to attach yourself to something. It's strange. Maybe there is an impermanence that people feel, I think. Well, we have this kind of thing in the life today. I mean, yeah. you feel floating. Today, when you read the papers this morning, it's frightening. You never know. Maybe, you know, in 1914, what, what starts to, to do a war? It's yes. a frightening situation. When you have that in the back of your mind, I think that everything becomes not frivolous, but not really of great importance. I'm terribly, uh, in my life, interested in life generally around me and in the world. I just don't work and say I don't care what's happening in Iran, for instance, or in Israel, or in Russia. I am really terribly involved with all that, and I realize fully well that my collection is important to me and to Trigère, but after all, what the, it, it really has not too much of an importance when you have the gravity, the seriousness of the situation in the world. Of I course. Am, I, I, it's very difficult to just say to someone, I want to be a designer, and forget the rest of the world. I couldn't work like that. Well, evidence of that is that I remember the biggest bit of fashion gossip that really is embedded in my head was the year that Pauline Fugere introduced a black model to the world of fashion. Nobody had ever seen a black model at one of the <laughs> You don't places. know, or do you know? Well, do you know the explosive, the well, explosion? I would, I'd like you to talk about it, because I do think it's important. And also, for me, because I, I remember it. I remember it very well, but I remember the talk. But I also felt at the time, what a marvelous use of one's own world well, to I make a statement. Do you know, when I stand. think about it, Robert, I did it. The girl was pretty. She was going to work for me, hopefully, as I wanted to. It wasn't... I never thought two minutes about the, re the repercussion at all. Yet, we had a few. First of all, her clipping book is amazing because from Afghanistan, we had clipping. From Russia. In Russian, we have them, I have the clippings. So it was a revolution. Look what happened to the black world of model today. I mean, on a fashion show, if you don't have seven versus six white, you don't have a fashion show. I think it went a little bit overboard, but if the girls are pretty and do their job, fine. But when I did that, and people say, you know, you're going to keep her? I said, sure, I'm going to keep it. We lost a few customers, one from Birmingham, Alabama, she said, if this woman is going to show me the thing, I'm not. I said, well, she took the door immediately. We never saw her again. It didn't bother me. But in the world, in the fashion cabin, in, in my uh, little room where we had this black girl for the first time, instead of having black people around to do the menial work, it was unbelievable. That was 19... Uh, 61. Huh? 61. 61 it was? Well, Audrey Zoltz, Audrey Smalls, you know Audrey? Yes, of course. Audrey, every time she speaks about Trigger, she always says, remember, she's the, she did a show in Washington for All Black, she told me. That's a fabulous girl, by the way. Uh, she knows. Many people today don't. But it, you know, it happened by accident. I'm very pleased with that little incident in my life, really.
I thought it was a marvelous reflection of something that I think um, people lose sight of, and that is that whether you consciously were concerned with the repercussions, you at least allowed yourself to work through any resistances that might have occurred and say, I don't care, she's, she's beautiful, she can wear the clothes, and I want her to do it, and it's my firm, and I want to make the statement. It's reflected in your attitude towards the woman who, from Birmingham who leaves. Well, it takes a certain amount of courage to take any yes. stand and make any change. Yes, you know, when I took a stand <laughs> voting for Carter on seven times, last time around, they looked at me as if I were crazy because nobody was... Well, anyway, I have. Uh, I hope the courage of my conviction and I hope uh, I don't lose that. But this has nothing to do with the world of designing. It has something to do uh, with the fact that I was maybe an immigrant once in this country. And though I didn't have to suffer too much, uh, the beginnings were very hard. But then, had we stayed in France, God knows we may not have been here at all. With, uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, it was, the Holocaust was for everyone, so I'm pleased to have had a few years of great, I mean, it was difficult. And I only could attach myself and I, what do you say, grip myself to the only thing I knew what to do. My husband too, so we worked very hard and I don't think working hard has ever killed anybody, which is the thing I like to keep in the tape for all the, the boys and girls who really want to become anything in life. And I don't think that growing older or more famous makes you relax more. That doesn't work like that. I think the responsibility is to work towards your own entourage is just as big. Maybe because you grow older, you don't take it as easily as you should. Maybe I'm f more fatigued, I don't know. But there is one thing sure. I just don't work less now than I worked 20 years ago. Well, don't you find that there are a couple of things there that operate? One is the reality that you now have other people who depend upon your talent and your business skill for their own livings. You have people who have... Yes, it's a uh, great responsibility. It really is. And sometimes I feel, I, I feel the pressure in time of collection. It's not because the, the creative process is difficult. But if I miss, you see, I told you that before, we are as good as the next collection, never as good as this one. That's fine, we'll sell it now. Next three months, what's going to happen? And that's tough, because all those people are there practically looking at you with the eyes darting at you. And now I'm making another collection for Schrader. The first one was uh, very good. And now I've got to make one that's equally as good or better and stronger. It's tough. If you were doing a composite woman, you know, who is the, who is the Trujet woman? You see yourself as the Trier woman? Do you see a woman? I couldn't uh, see myself, but I think that a, a Trier woman is a woman who is interested in her family, in her husband, her lover. She's there not to just take, but also to give. I think it's a woman who has something in her brain, who is interested in the world affair, who certainly um, uh, is interested in her children's work at school, I hope that I work for a woman who's not static. I hope that I work for a woman who is not uh, only playing cards, let's say, or playing golf. I hope that she has some interest in the life of her entourage and certainly her family. That will make her more interesting to me. Though the lady who used to be called the doll of fashion is an inter interesting creature because she can just buy clothes and wear them and that's it. Um, I love a woman who has an idea of why she buys the clothes besides covering herself. Actually, the people who buy Trigia clothes probably don't need another dress in their closet. I'm sure they all have plenty of clothes and plenty of fur coats and so on. So she has to know why and how she uses her money. I, don't, I hope she's not frivolous. And yet, I probably cut my own appeal because the women who years ago were skept, who just had nothing to do but buy clothes, 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 is a certainly marvelously an animal in our uh, world of uh, fashion. We welcome her. 
Speaking of, um, well, let's say the mark and the identification of Trigier, I think if we were to do a simple sketch in a magazine or run it on a television screen of uh, a turtle placed somewhere unexpectedly on the dress, the side of the arm, uh, the middle of the hip, the uh, near the hem of the skirt, a jewel turtle, a piece. I think everybody who saw that and knew anything about fashion at all would know that one was saying Trigier. Tell me about the turtle. Well, yesterday I wore a rather an extraordinary dress. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. And the woman said, it's fabulous, but where is the turtle? <laughs> it's funny, it was there at the bottom, but you couldn't see it in the embroidery. The turtle. I had once a friend who was a jeweler, and uh, he was trying to do something. He said to me, well, can't, don't make me something that won't take too much gold, but that will be interesting. And I doodle, really, I have it, I have the sketch. We made this famous turtle. He had a very good model maker, and he made that the grandmother of this turtle, and I'm wearing the bigger one. You know, I made this. I'll show you the sketch, because I like to have it published one day. So we made that turtle. And it was about an inch long. It's like a turtle, but it didn't take too much gold because it's uh, kind of transparent, you know. Then we made one that was a little smaller, the same one, reduced. So we had three turtles. That was in 1947, I think. 46 or 7. And in 1948, 49, I got my first Courtier Award. My brother Robert went to La Vieille Russie, you know, they still are on Fifth Avenue, and bought me, uh, bought me as a present a Fabergé turtle in tiny sapphire, small little thing. So here I had another turtle. Then I got another uh, Coty Award and he bought me another turtle, another Fabergé. Very pretty. So now I'm five turtles. Then in 1952, 53, I went around looking for a house, and I saw many houses. And the house that I own now was an old decrepit nothing, you know, tiny old farmhouse with a pond, and on the pond was a rock, and on the rock were three turtles sunning themselves, you know, three turtles about 10 inches long. And I looked at those turtles in a dismal end of March day. My brother was with me, I said, where if was I this? In Lewisboro, where? In Westchester. I said, if I get that house, I'm going to call it La Tortue, which means the turtle. I bought the house, I call it La Tortue, and from there on the turtles are, you don't know. I have something like 875 turtles, counting the plates and the dishes, and uh, I've got turtles everywhere. That's the story of the turtle. Is this because people give you things that have the turtle on it? Because yeah, they, everybody okay. gives me a turtle. I'm, I'm trying to tell everybody that I want diamonds. <laughs> they don't believe me. They still give me turtles. They give me turtle in chocolates, give me turtle embroidery. Some are. A turtle is not a pretty animal. No, it's also thought of as being uh, plodding, slow moving. Uh, but no, uh, uh, yes, but it's, uh, it's sturdy and a sign of longevity and happiness. In the world of the turtle in the Orient, it's almost godlike there. Did you know that when you designed no, it originally? No. Not at all. Absolutely not. I found that out when I went to Japan in 1962. I bought many turtles and embroidered. You know, I bought some thing about eight inch, 18 inches square with a turtle on top. And I said, what were those? They were the baptismal, ba I can't pronounce. Baptismal. Baptismal, a pillow cover for the rich Japanese who would present the baby to their grandparents but it will put the baby on a turtle kind of a embroidery to bring, it's like a fairy godmother giving the child, you know, uh, uh, good looks. And good. This was a, a promise for the child to be long life, sturdiness, etc., etc. And they are fabulous. I was just given a book the day before yesterday by Melanie Grau, Melanie Cain Grau, a tiny little tiny book that belonged to Ben Grau which I'm going to, I'm sorry I don't have it here. It's a tiny little thing on parchment that she found in Ben's paper showing turtles in the old, in the Persia. The turtle is there because it's a, an animal that you can trust in a way. 
So I don't move like a turtle, I hope. I'm no, no, you're very fast. Like <laughs> I've always found that, you know, that's always interested me because you are a fast talker, you are a fast sketcher, you are a fast uh, cutter. Everything you do, you do very rapidly. You have a high level of energy. And uh, I've always been amused that you are also associated with the turtle who just... Well, it's well. a pure accident. Yeah. It's very... It's well, a, it, 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 was there anything in your head when you did that first little doodle? Not Nothing. at all. Just I just did it, and that's what you know. it... Not at all. It's a very strange thing. But now when the house is called La Tortue, you don't know. But you see, you discover things. In collecting things, I don't have many in here, the turtle world from all the world is something extraordinary. In Italy, of course, uh, the shells and so on, it's amazing. I saw a man at a theater intermission last week. He says, I haven't seen him in 10 years. I saw him the last time in Mickey Nose. He says, I was thinking of you this afternoon, Pauline. I forgot his name. I said, well, he says, I just made a piece of furniture with two fabulous shells of turtle, you know. So here I am. I'm in the head of people because I'm a turtle collector. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> what about uh, La Tortue as a place to escape? Are you a different person at La Tortue than you are here in 525 Park Avenue? I think so. First, I love the place. It becomes an insanity, I guess. I guess I'm getting too attached to this. It's like, uh, I don't know. I haven't got the time, Robert, to do all the things I want to do. And if I were to change anything in this apartment or in the house, you take a decorator, you take a painter, and they will do it. That's fine if you decide what you want. I am terribly involved with the garden, and this is something that is a passion. And I just planted, not that many tulips, but plenty. I can't wait until I see, I hope God's give me this year to see if my planting of the oranges and the yellow and the, is going to come out the way I want to. And as I designed the garden, which is something new to me, I mean, it's new, it's 20 years of experience, but really solidly designing a garden, I, I cleared some land. It's a passion, I love it. I go there and I work all the time. This Sunday I read a little bit, which is something that I don't do as much as I wanted to. It gives me, the country is an escape, first of all, uh, health-wise. I go mostly Friday night. Now, yesterday at the big dinner party I said, I want to invite you, but I know you won't come. I said, why won't I? Because it's Friday, I said, you're right. I won't come, why should I go to another cocktail party on a Friday night when I can be in the country? And it's true, breathe the fresh air. I don't put any makeup. My hair flies any direction. It doesn't matter. What about clothes? Over there? The oh, that's funny. <laughs> I wear all dungarees, nothing. But I have practical clothes with big pockets because I'm always with my clippers. In the country, at night, if I receive people, I may as well, uh, probably in the country, I would have uh, trousers, pants, and my famous turtle shirt. You see, we made a turtle scarf 20 years ago, and I have 20 shirts. They are all the same shirts, just like a man's shirt in fantastic colors, red pants, blue pants. I have that, so that's a backbone. If I go to people in the country, I'll wear a, I, maybe a long skirt and a very simple top. I don't dress there, I mean, ever. But during the day, it's very funny because anything old goes, it doesn't matter. Do you cook? Oh, yes. Oh, I, I cook. Uh, not as much as I would want to. I cook. I, it's funny because I do things. This year, I had great fun doing all kinds of things with the vegetable from the garden. We had too much. I overplanted, and all of a sudden, it grew. But it all comes in at the same time. That's one of the problems. You, have to, you learn. Uh, as you know, I garden a great deal myself. You learn, you learn if you have to, you have to plant these things by delaying the planting. In other words, if you separate well, it by it's, four you or see, five days. It's like everything else. Now I'm learning. It's making a collection. I know that I planted my peas too much together and I didn't have enough when I wanted them. So you learn that too. So I make plans in advance. And luckily, my housekeeper adores gardening and adores the garden. So. 
we plant cells, if we plant exotic things, <laughs> you know, we're going to have our own gourds on the table for Thanksgiving. Beautiful. That was her idea. Fabulous. It's fantastic, the shape of those things. Yes, they are. They're and I will the colors are wonderful, too. I will mix them with just food. That I like. It's experimental. I love to do things with dead, dead branches, with branches. I'm not going to go and buy flowers uh, for Thanksgiving. I like what I have. What, I is, your, what is your role? You know, we, we, we know about your role as a designer. We know about your role as a public figure, celebrity, um, your private role in terms of your relationship to your garden. What is your role as a, as a mother, as a grandmother, as a mother-in-law? Well, I would say that this question should be directed to my children and to my daughter-in-law and to my granddaughter. I think that my relationship, it seems that for a while my boys never took me seriously. Now they work, one works with me constantly, the other one uh, part-time. And uh, there is, the, because I'm the mother, I suppose, there is the maybe lack of patience, maybe they criticize me more than they would uh, their boss if they had one. I think they love me, I think they respect me, they also think that I'm, uh, I don't make too much sense, I think. Yes. I think they are good friends to me, I think I'm a good friend to them. Which is more than just have a, a son that you see every, I, I think, uh, with the everyday contact, which is never too easy between people who love each other. Yeah, you're, you're a very strong lady. Are you a dominating mother? I don't think I'm a dominating mother. I may be a dominating um, associate in the work. I don't think I'm a dominating mother. I don't think they would have stood for it. Yet I'd ra I, I raised the two boys by myself, you know, so that was not, wasn't easy. I think we have a marvelous relationship now with my daughter-in-law. Uh, it's fun because she asks all kinds of questions what to do, and we discuss all kinds of things with her. It's well, so fun. you've never had a daughter, so it's, you know, it gives you the fun of having that at the moment. I think that my, my daughter-in-law, the mother of my granddaughter, for a while I wouldn't trust me very much with Karen. She thought I was anti mame which probably I have in her, I am in her eyes, but you know, she, really, until she let me have Karen for an hour, it took uh, the child four years of her life before she came <laughs> here and spent. <laughs> now, thank God I'm trusted. I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, it's fun to be. Have you ever found yourself babysitting? Oh, yes. Yes? Mm -hmm. Not often because they have, but. Last week she asked me, I'd like to do it a little more, but I want the child for me alone for one solid day. I had her. I had her a day that it was raining cats, dogs, mountains. And the child came to me, I took her from here on a Friday night, and Saturday it poured. This was in the country. That was in the country. I said, Karen, did you bring any books? Nothing. She comes to me with her parents with packs of toys, of cards, of games, of anything. That day, she came with nothing. What was I going, we were going to swim. It was in, uh, you know, we had those delusion uh, flood. We couldn't go to the, to the pool. So I took the car and went to New Canaan and bought books and toys. I had to, you know. We had a good time. I think she enjoyed it. I hope she comes again very soon. She's coming for Thanksgiving. Are they all coming to you for Thanksgiving? There still is the traditional role for you to play as the I, I didn't the invite family. them. They invited themselves. Well, that's the nicest thing, I think. Yeah. I was going to be invited. But they said, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? I said, what, do you want to come? Yes. OK, so I'm cooking a turkey, naturally. What else am I going to cook? Do you bake pies and things like that? No, I don't bake. I don't bake, first of all, because I find people are always fighting their weight, so why shall I bake? I don't bake. I, the only baking I do is making a quiche, a quiche lorraine, that's all. You bake cakes and bread, of course, bread, your fabulous yes, bread. Yes. But I don't know. I love bread and butter. It's probably my favorite food, if anybody asks me. With bread and butter, I'm fine anywhere and a glass of wine. I'm perfect with that. No, I don't bake. I don't have the time. And I find myself a poor cook in a way, because when you cook, and you want to cook well, and you make a white sauce or something, the telephone rings, goodbye the sauce. And I can't resist the telephone. 
How, what do I do? Do you uh, use La Tortue for uh, the press or for other business? Do you have, you have buyers, clients? Sometimes. You do? Yeah, we had some last week. But I have to have uh, the buyers who, who, who have some rapport. I just don't invite the buyers because they, what they say on 7th Avenue, push the pencil, not that. There is no time, Robert, for that. The country, I have a very funny setup. I have to work on Saturday in the garden because I don't have a gardener by the week. You can't find them. So I have a crew who comes on Saturday when they don't work somewhere else. And so I'm very involved. And for me to have a party on Sunday, it's a lot of work. But I love it. I love the country. I love it in the winter. I love it now. I, I'm telling you, I have cleared some woods and some places, and the vision of what I would like to do is to get a bulldozer and get a few rocks away. I don't know that I'm going to do it now, because when you do that, then you have to recede, you have to, you know. How large is the area? How many it's acres? not big. I have four acres. Four acres. Well, that's a lot in Westchester. It's a lot when you have almost three under cultivation, which yes. is what I have. Yes. It's a lot. I have a neighbor across the street from me who is a charming man who bought a fantastic property. And one day he invited me and I came out of his property, which is directly opposite of mine. And I saw that what he saw coming out of his property was a bunch of messy trees. And I said, he can't do that. So I started clearing the property. I always tell him that he cost me money because I cleared. But it's beautiful now. I've got rocks, fabulous rocks. I'm built on rocks. It's fun. I love it. That's part of designing, you know, to me. Yes, I think it's very much a part of designing. Very much a part of design. To know where to... I did know that. My favorite story in, in gardening is when I left and I had a gardener who was there all the time. I said, Stanley, you want to put that tree here and then this there. And I came back the next Saturday. I said, uh-uh, I don't like it there. So we move more trees, like moving a pocket. doesn't work with the tree, you know. No, it's very it, difficult to do that. Yeah, it's with the tree, we're sensitive. It doesn't work. Do you grow a plan when you when you garden? When I plant my tulips, yes. Yes, so I do the colors, colors yeah. and for the big beds, and then the rest of it. But uh, there is an area that I clear where I won't have any flowers. I will only have greens and different colors, uh, maple. So it's very pretty, but no flowers there. But I have one, the flowers on the left, and you have an area to swim. Oh yes, I've got an enormous pool. I see. That, that uh, muddy pond that I uh, cleared is cemented in the bottom. It's 90 feet long, my dear. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. It's a beautiful pool. It's not pale blue like my mother. When she came to me, she says, Pauline, why don't you paint it blue like every other? <laughs> I can't. It's stone, you know. Yes. No, it's a pleasant place for me. One uh, final question on this particular tape. And that could, when you talk about your family, I love what happens to your face, and I love the, the sense that you have that it is their judgment of you that has to be evaluated, not the other mm -hmm. way around. Uh, when, when you go to the college, when you go to the Fashion Institute of Technology, working with students, because I know for me, when I teach there, they are, in some way, I am the father, I am the daddy, I, am, I feel a responsibility to them. Uh, the industry and my profession has been very good to me as it has been very good to yes. you. And I feel that there is a need to give back and uh, offer something. If you influence one person, it's a major contribution that you're making to this, this whole fashion world. What is your basic feeling about dealing with those students? I hope I do give them something. It's time consuming, Robert, you know. Yes, I know. Uh, lots of time, taxi fares, etc., etc., which is fine and get up, well, I always get up early, but it's uh, many mornings, instead of doing your own work or staying in bed, which I never do anyway. And so I feel that given when I do that job, I do it seriously. I don't show any impatience with them. I am a very quick worker. I don't have that much relationship with those young people because in uh, four hours or three hours, you have to see 22 or 23. So we don't have enough time to give each one. And I find myself giving more to one who I think responds to me and my, let's call it teaching, more than another. I do find that some students are not 
responding to me, respond, responding to me. Maybe they fight me a little bit. Maybe they resent mm, my position or the fact that I know a little more. But I love to do it. I wish I could do more. I've been asked to do it again. Now I don't know that I can. I, you know, Parson and FIT and all that. I do it not every year. It's, it's a satisfactory, if I feel that I find two or three people in that class that have learned something from me, I'm terribly pleased, I must say. Is it possible that you could develop some sort of an apprentice program at your, at your own? Uh... Yes, and it's really maybe, uh, you know, Jerry Silverman always told me, why don't you just train some people? And I said, well, it's difficult, but this year I did, and I trained a girl, I'm, I'm having one now, who seems to be uh, quite pleased in what she does, and who listens. I told her, I said, just listen. If you don't understand, come and ask again. Uh, it's very satisfactory to know that you have trained someone, and that they, in turn, uh, respect what you've told them. Yeah, was this somebody that you got from FIT? Mm -hmm. That's very good. That's a very good beginning. You see, I think there's, there should be an increased responsibility on the part of the major designers to uh, train. I, I'd love to, to do more, you know, in an organization like ours. I know there are some designers on 7th Avenue who take every year two or three of those kids who graduate. I don't have the room. I also don't have the time to go and watch over everyone. Well, and it's I, also a difference. If you take two or three people and they simply become uh, gophers, if they simply are Well, not gophers, but they become to me sometimes of a burden because you have to spend 10 minutes an hour to go and see what they do. Uh, actually, I'm not a teacher and we are not a school. Everything that we do, uh, we pay the people. It's an expensive program if you don't get a little bit something in return. Uh, Maybe I'll have more patience. I'm trying to get more room in the place to try to get a few more, because I think it's very essential. And if a few can be trained for the future, I'll be very happy. I think that's a wonderful place to close this interview. The <laughs> fact that we really are talking about the reality that the fashion world will continue always. Oh, definitely. And that one of the contributions that any major force such as yourself can make is to assure the growth and the continuation by offering something to the young people to train them to build. Well, I hope that uh, I did my part and I hope to continue to do it for a few more years. You never know naturally what uh, is in store for you. I try to for myself, I would like to just be a little more organized in my days and uh, the division of my hours, which it doesn't relent, it, it's an amazing accumulation of things. And sometime I have a day quite planned and I come to the office and the first five seconds everything is destroyed, everything I planned to do out goodbye, it went the way of uh, I don't know what, because the problems of uh, a house when you were either sleeping or you were not there for an hour, that bothers me. I should be able to just do one thing. I don't think I ever will, though. No, I, th I think we are, uh, as human beings and talents, we cannot be all things. You cannot be the rigid, organized, executive of the American corporate structure, uh, the business graduate from Harvard Business School or Wharton School of Finance. No, you can't. And still be this wonderfully exciting, creative personality who can uh, bubble at any given moment I and remember, produce something. I remember an interview given by Jerry Stutz to Life magazine many, many, many years ago when she became uh, the president of Bandel, and it was very new in the world to have a woman president of a store. She gave that interview and she said uh, that she knew exactly how to separate her life, her private life, and the world of Bandel and her world as a president of that store. 
She said, for instance, that she never took a piece of paper or a suitcase or a briefcase or something with the work of the store to her home. And I remember me telling her, I said, Jerry, you'll have to tell me how to do that because I can't. I have many, I make notes and I bring them here and in my bed at night, before I go to sleep, there is a lot of things that are, and certainly on Sunday, paying bills, doing this, and even the thing of running the place, I can never separate them entirely. I guess and there are some people who can, but... Oh, well, I'm, you know, I, perhaps there are people who can, but, but I don't think anybody ever separates anything entirely because you cannot lock your mind up. Uh, you do respond. The eye absorbs, the ear hears and takes in new uh, sounds, new direction. Uh, simple gossip at a dinner table yeah. may affect a whole direction Absolutely. of something that you want to do. Uh, no, I think we are, there's a lag very frequently between what we, uh, what we say and what we do. And uh, there are, one of the things of course that the American male has been attacked for is that he lives, breathes, eats, sleeps his business and his work to a destructive element for himself and Probably. his family and his children. And I think it's conceivable that when Jerry was made president of that store back 25 years ago, that um, if she felt it necessary to establish the fact that she was not going to be uh, Possibly a victim maybe she, of all that. Maybe it was true. I don't know. I admire that very much because I know I could never do it. Uh, that's why I love the country so much, because though I work there and have, in time of collection, for instance, I have a little workroom on the top floor of my house with a couple of dummies, and I very frequently uh, take old pieces of fabric, I mean, not necessarily new one, and will make dresses that will bring, I will bring back on Sunday morning, on Monday morning to the office. I don't consider that work. It's funny, for, it's fun for me to do it. And sometimes we need that special dress that I will do in the quietness of, uh, of the country. But actually, the country is good for me because I want to escape there. I want to get there. I came back Monday morning instead of Sunday night, and I felt so good about leaving just Monday morning. I took that extra night, and I watched television late. You know, I find it's a renewal. I mean, I, you know, I go to the country oh, also in another it's direction. Fabulous. But it's fabulous. It's a renewal for me, and I come back to the city uh, just as excited about returning to oh, the city me too. and uh, plunging into my professional activities. You have said one thing, and I think we should close here because I know you have to get on to the fashion group. Um, I, uh, I have found uh, that there is a very strong reality in my life, and that is that I don't uh, consider my work, seven-eighths of my work, as uh, a negative term, such as I have to go to work. Uh, oh, as a burden. Produce, as a burden, no. it is not. I enjoy it. It is the thing that uh, keeps me sensing that there is so much more to learn constantly, and it feeds the very thing that you have. We have we share something in common. I've always known it for many, many years. Is that we're both intensely curious people. Absolutely. We want to know more. Absolutely. That's Thank true. Thank That's you, Pauline. Appreciate it.